You know, some people say that we're living in dark days, that uh, we've got a lot of problems, and I can't help but think we've still got it really good here. Hey, welcome back to the Colorblind Architect Podcast. I'm your host, David, and yes, I actually still think we've got it really good in America. I am still amazed that it's actually still a thing that people can complain about somebody using the wrong pronoun. I mean, like seriously, that's what you've got to worry about? Not starving to death? You know, not dying at the hands of murderous Nazis. No, no, you're you're complaining about somebody calling you by the wrong gender. Okay, well, yeah, you've got it good, man. You've got it good, or woman, whatever. I don't care. Anyways, here's the thing: we are living in a world where there are a lot of miscarriages of just justice. Um, this this week. The uh, Derek Chauvin uh, verdict came out. He was found guilty on all the counts. And I didn't even really want to make a video about this topic. And so I kind of won't. But at the same time, I still want to touch on it. Because I think it speaks to an issue that we're all facing uh, throughout the world. And that is miscarriages of justice. Now, in the case of Derek Chauvin, I, I can't I can't say if he was, you know, given the correct verdict or not. Okay? I that's not my place to judge. My gut is telling me based on the things that I've heard, the things that I've read, the things that I know about the story, I can't help but feeling like, yeah, maybe that verdict was a little bit uh I don't know, off. Uh, not that I think that he was a saint, and nor do I think that George Floyd should have died. Actually, I, I think it was a horrible tragedy for both of them. Um, but that's not the miscarriage of justice that I want to talk about. I mean, let's take, for example, the miscarriage of justice that occurred with the entire series of riots this past summer and also leading up to the trial and also the riots happening after the shooting uh, by that uh, by that female police officer who said taser 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 right and you, you can't help but wonder what was going on why why did that happen well one of the miscarriages of justice I would say is that that police officer, she didn't receive enough training and possibly even not the correct training. Now, I am I I have no idea how to do police work, so I'm just guessing. But my, my feeling is that we probably need our police officers to have more training. We also need to make sure that they're better paid so that they can actually do their job and we can attract better quality uh, police officers and you know not to say that the ones that we have are bad I mean like all the police officers I know are great people I mean I I can't complain now granted I'm in Utah and one thing is one thing that Utah is definitely not known for is um, high crime now there is crime but it's not exactly a place where you're you're worried about, you know, going into downtown Salt Lake City at the, in the middle of the night and wondering whether or not you're going to live through the experience. No, you could be in downtown Salt Lake City, pretty much anywhere part of Salt Lake City. And yeah, you're you're going to be fairly safe. I mean, it's a pretty dang safe place to live, right? So what are we talking about? Well, I, I think here the the training's probably sufficient for the officers that we have. Um, but maybe they could have more training. 
I mean, there are still officer-involved shootings that occur here in Utah. Um, they're not as common as in other parts of the country, but, you know, it's still it still happens. So I think police across the board, that's one of the miscarriages of justice, is that we don't get sufficient training for our police officers. Another miscarriage of justice. Why was George Floyd even in the situation that he was? Let's look at it. He was on fentanyl. He was doing drugs. And he was, he was buying them illegally. And why was he buying them illegally? Well, the story that I've heard is that he became addicted to opioids because of pain meds. And when the prescription ended, he was addicted and he, he had to keep that fix coming because withdrawals from opi opioids are really rough, right? So that's a miscarriage of justice too. That first off, that he was even made to be addicted to opioids by, sounds like, a, poli a doctor who prescribed him an opioid and then we as a society don't have a meaningful way to help people get off these pain meds look if we're going to have opio opioids if we're going to have pain medications that get people addicted if we're going to allow that as a society then we need also provide the means for people to be rehabilitated so that they can get off those drugs safely and be able to return to a normal life. There's, and it's not a racial thing. I, I think there's plenty of people of all races who get hooked on these opioids. And it's a really sad and tragic thing. So now, did that lead George Floyd into a life of crime where he, you know, I, I believe he was, um, you know, I, I believe he was accused of rape uh, he, he definitely broke into some woman's house and um, there was also a story about him, you know, stealing and, you know, quite, uh, quite commonly. And also he was carrying a counterfeit bill, you know, that's also a crime. And so y you wonder, did the crime precede the addiction to the drugs or did the drugs cause him to become a criminal? And if it's the latter then that's a huge miscarriage of justice as well. Well, and then what about Derek Chauvin? Well, that was a miscarriage of justice too. He wasn't properly trained, maybe. Uh, the, the fact that the Minneapolis Police Department had that on the list of things uh, to do, and they were training their officers to do that, and then when they get caught, when the Minneapolis Police Chief gets caught with his pants down because... Now Derek Chauvin's making him look bad. Then Derek Chauvin gets basically put up as the scapegoat so that the people in power, the police chief, the mayor, the, the governor, and all that stuff, they they basically kick him to the curb and like, well, oh yeah, Derek Chauvin's just a racist. Um, how about the fact that you guys taught him to do this and you had it in the manual as a proper technique and now you're treating him like persona non grata because he did what he was told to do and look I, I don't care about Derek Chauvin as a person necessarily because I don't know his story I don't know if he's a good person or a bad person I just know that he was doing what he was ordered to do I, I don't I don't see how we hold him responsible for that. But at the same time, yeah, he, he, did, he still did it. I mean, he could have refused the order. So that's another miscarriage of justice. Did he have an inkling? Did he have a, a feeling in his mind that he was doing something wrong? And so a lot of these questions come right down to the question of, Along the way, so many people are doing things antithetical to what they feel and know is right. And this is why I say miscarriages of justice. 
we have in our society a tendency to do what is expedient, what is convenient, instead of actually what is right. Even the jury, think about the jury. The jury, clearly, they were pressured. Their, their names and addresses were known. So they knew that the rioters were going to burn their houses down if they were to, you know, acquit um, Derek Chauvin. So how do we think that these jurors actually were going to say anything other than guilty? They were, f they were scared for their life. They knew very well that the riots were going on. So that was another miscarriage of justice. People doing what's expedient, what's convenient, instead of what's right. Again, I don't know if Derek Chauvin should be guilty, found guilty, or should be found innocent. Look, I wasn't in that jury. I didn't even watch the trial because, frankly, I found it all just a political S show, right? I, I, I don't think it was a real trial. I think it was a, I think it was a kangaroo court. It was a show trial, basically, to fulfill the appearance of justice, while basically taking Derek Chauvin and saying, "No, you, you're the scapegoat. You're the, pro the you're the reason why all the problems are." No, he's he's a he's a symptom. Okay. Derek Chauvin's not the cause of the problems in this country. Nor is anybody else, okay? The, the cause of the problems is that all of us, all of us throughout society, try too much to do what's expedient or convenient for ourselves. And as a result, it creates... A miscarriage of justice as a result it causes problems it causes other people to suffer so how do we fix that problem well the only way to fix it is we've all got to, we've all got to learn we've got to learn about morality we've got to learn about what exactly is the right thing now I, I, I think too many people They've departed from religion. They've departed from Christianity. They've departed from Judeo-Christian values. And whether that's good or bad is in the eye of the eye of the beholder. Obviously, I'm I'm a little bit opinionated on it, and I do believe that it was bad because ultimately, what Judeo-Christian values provided society was a common set of morality that allowed us to build a framework of trust in each other to a magnificent scale where billions of people were able to are able to interact and exchange goods and services because there's trust see you've got to have trust in order to have commerce are you going to do business with somebody that you don't trust no, of course not, right? If you think somebody's a shyster, you're gonna you're gonna stay away from them. But if you feel like you can trust the person, there's a good chance that maybe you'll do business with them. So, how did we get there to have that level of trust? Well, when we have a common system of values and in the case of Judeo-Christian values, that, that provided us that common frame, that common system of, of morality. I mean, if you think about it, what are the Ten Commandments other than a common set of rules that if we all abide by, then we can know, okay, well, I can trust that if I start doing business with Bob over here, he's not going to, he's not going to, He's not going to covet my donkey and steal my donkey and then make love to my wife. See, right? You know, 
I know, I know, those are old-fashioned um, commandments, right? But I think we all like to know that our spouse isn't hooking up with somebody else, right? So maybe the thou shalt not commit adultery commandment is actually still a valid one. Thou shalt not lie. Well, yeah, that would be a really, really helpful one for people to do, right? Because think about it. If people don't bear false witness, like as in you can trust that their word is their bond. Now, when you make a contract with them, you, you know that they're going to uphold their contract because they said that they would. And so that allows you to trust that that business relationship is going to be a positive one and that you're going to mutually benefit from that exchange of com commerce. So a large part of why Judeo-Christian values were so integral to making us the wealthiest country on the planet, well, <laughs> it's really simple. We... We had the largest free trade zone based on a system of common morality and trust where theoretically you've got 330 million people that you can do business with back and forth. And if you expand that to the entire Anglo-Saxon world, you know, England, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, now all of a sudden you've got an even bigger sphere of people that you can do business with, right? And if you've all got that common set of morality, that common set of values, right? You're able to do even more business and that increased amount of exchange of goods and services enriches everybody, right? Well, then you expand it even further. Now let's expand it to places like France, Germany, Spain, even Japan, Russia, Korea. Now you're doing even better. And the more we're able to expand that common set of values. But see, there's the thing. We've got to have a common set of values. If you don't have a common set of values. And see, where do the riots come from? Well, that's a different set of values. See, the people who are rioting, they're not doing it because they agree with Judeo-Christian values. Here's the thing. If you agree with Judeo-Christian values, you're not out there rioting. You're not looting a target to take a TV for yourself because if you have Judeo-Christian values, then you know that thou shalt not steal is one of them, right? Well, thou shalt not steal precludes you from looting. Okay? And... Thou shalt not covet. That's the number 10, right? That would keep you away from communism. Because communism is a... Ah, well, that's definitely an S show. But that particular ideology is 100% based on coveting thy neighbor's arse. Okay? Well, they're donkey, right? That's what it says in the Bible. Okay, I'm just quoting. But th th that's the thing. I mean... Y if you're, if you're coveting, because that's the whole idea is that the poor are coveting what the rich have, right? And it's because of that that they're saying it's unfair that the rich have that. And so it's an unjust system because the rich are exploited. Okay, maybe there is some truth to exploitation of the poor. I think there probably is. However, if your concern about the exploitation is because so-and-so has more money than you, then you've just committed a, a sin against the Tenth Amendment. I mean, the Tenth Commandment, right? So, I'm fairly certain that the rioters, even if they are nominally Christian or Jewish, they do not understand even the Mosaic Law. They do not even understand the Ten Commandments. Because if they did, they would stay away from burning down buildings and looting targets for televisions because that would be antithetical to the commandments. That would be antithetical to the behavior that they've been taught 
in that system of morality. And what system of morality actually does promote this violence? Well, nihilism. Anarchy. That, And that's the weird part. See, when you get right down to it, communism is a form of totalitarian or a, basically a monarchy. It's, it's back to the might is right, the power is power uh, type of argument. It's a very ancient, very primordial system of government because it's based on the idea that I've got bigger guns than you or I've got a bigger stick than you, so I'm going to beat you into compliance. Whereas Judeo-Christian values... They're based on a system of mutual respect that I respect that you're going to govern yourself and you'll respect that I'm going to govern myself. And so we'll accept each other's freedom in exchange for self-control, right? Whereas in a communistic or totalitarian system, it's 100% based on compulsion. You have to do this. Because if I say so, and if you don't do it, I'm going to throw you in the gulag, right? And so it's a different system of values. Now, how does this play into nihilism or anarchy? Well, the nihilism and anarchy are basically people who have lost faith in any system. And they just, it's like, to hell with it. Like, the, the, the globe is just, the world is just a an S show and it's not worth living. It's not worth trying. So I'm just going to screw everything up and I'm just going to destroy everything. That's kind of the idea behind nihilism. And then, of course, anarchy is... It's kind of the libertarian v version. And by libertarian, I mean it's, the, it's this Pollyannish type of belief in freedom. This idea, and, and Michael Malice is an example of this. He's, he's so far to the extreme in libertarian anarchy. He doesn't see that it's never going to work. And the reason why is because it relies 100% on people behaving, right? You have to have people behaving for a system of anarchy to actually work, right? And how are you going to have people behave? Well, by what system of values? Again, you have to have a common set of values. What is behaving? Right? For example, in a Judeo-Christian value system, technically, according to the Bible, homosexuality is not behaving. Okay? Well, but under the current modern system... The, of values homosexuality is bad therefore Christianity is bad no, homosexuality is good according to the modern sensibilities therefore Christianity is bad because Christianity preaches that homosexuality is bad and so now you've got a conflict of values and there doesn't necessarily need to be a conflict of values but there is, right? so again coming right down to it we need to have a common set of values. And what are those value, values? Wh what actually unifies us? Could it be the Constitution? Well, the Constitution, again, that was based on a Judeo-Christian set of values. The, the founding fathers, when they wrote that, they were very much steeped in Judeo-Christian belief systems. So... Are we just going to throw that away and say, okay, well, what, what are our new values? Well, again, are we even having the conversation? No, we're just going head forward, just boldly into this brave new world of, I don't know what the crap is actually good and what's bad because it changes on a daily basis because nobody's having that conversation about what our shared morality is. And as a result... We keep having miscarriage of justice after miscarriage of justice, problem after problem, and it's just going to keep going until we actually have that conversation. 
my belief is that we need to return to some sort of belief in God and Judeo-Christian values. Because I think that's the easiest, safest way for us to ensure, because we already know it's worked in the past, right? So let's maybe use that as a foundation. Maybe we could use that as a means of ensuring that we're on a firm footing rather than going into the quicksand saying, oh yeah, we're going to, we're going to change pronouns on people and, and make people say stuff like G and J or whatever, whatever those pronouns are. I have no clue. I, I, th that stuff doesn't make sense to me. And again, that's just a symptom. That's not the actual root problem. You know, if you want to be trans, go be trans. I don't freaking care. Just don't make me learn your pronouns. And don't get mad at me if I don't know your pronouns. Because you know what? Again, there are still people on this planet who are starving. There are still people on this planet living, you know, in concentration camps. Okay? And so, don't sit there and tell me that I'm committing some kind of crime by accidentally calling you he or she because... I saw that you were wearing a dress and said she, and just assumed because, yeah, you know, that's the way it's been for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, and so there was just kind of an assumption there, right? I, I'm not trying to hate on anybody. That's the thing. So stop worrying about the microaggressions. Stop worrying about the minor things. You have it too good. Your life is too rosy, too perfect, too happy to realize what real problems are. There's millions of Uyghur, Uyghurs in concentration camps in China right now. There's like 10 million people in Hong Kong, or 7 million, I can't remember how many, who are now under the jackboot thug dictatorship of communist China. Yeah, what about them? you think they're caring right now about whether somebody said the right pronoun? No, they're a little bit more worried about something a bit more serious. You know, like the loss of their civil liberties. You know? So, get off your high horses. Stop thinking that you're superior to anyone else. And maybe actually read the Bible. Maybe actually study some philosophy. Maybe actually try to figure out what is your system of morality. Because that's part of our problem, is we do not have a common set of morality anymore in this country. And we for damn sure better get a common set of morality. Because otherwise, this country is going to fall apart. I don't think it will. I think my belief is that we're going to turn the corner. My belief is that as we have in the past as Americans, I think the silent majority is going to wake back up, return to God, return to the Bible, return to the Constitution, and return to the principles and foundation that we built this an enormously successful nation upon. And we're going to start fixing things. We're going to start getting things back in order. But it's going to be a lot of work. It's going to be hard. But I believe it's going to happen. I, I believe that we are not so far gone that we're going to fall down the same trap that other countries have, such as Cuba or China or, um, or Soviet Russia back in the day. Um, I think we still have enough goodness in this country that I believe that we can recover. But it's, like I said, it's going to be hard work. We've got to really study and learn. And with that, I leave you again for another day. I'm the Colorblind Architect. Peace out.